Okay, okay. so uh, it's going to be quite casual. Lah. So as I mentioned in the Facebook group, uh, no point me reiterate what is already out there. I think in terms of uh, product management, there's a lot to read about online. Uh, one of my favorite authors is basically uh, uh, Kagan. You can search for him, his book Inspired. So that's a good book for product management. And then there's a whole bunch that talks about product management. Uh, so today I'm just going to talk about uh, shipping. I mean my role basically at Redmart, I mean all along my role has always been uh, involving products, whether is it on the design level or whether is it on the management level, uh, it has always been about products. So today I'm going to talk specifically for products but I think it applies across board uh, even to my own life. So I guess I'll be sharing about shipping. Um, because the measurement of success uh, for me in anything that I do is basically about shipping. I mean, if you fail to ship, I mean, uh, you don't perform. So that's my role, uh, specifically at Redmark currently. That's what I do. Um, so I'm just going to share some principles that I have uh, gleaned over the years of uh, dealing with products, whether as a freelancer or whether in a startup or whether in, in MNC. So, principles worth uh, pondering. So, as you can see, just a bit of background about myself, uh, for those who are not really uh, aware. Um, so, I, I love products. Um, and how do I find out is basically, uh, when I look around me, I mean, everything that we use is about products. Uh, whether it's the chair. So, I'm someone who just really uh, like to appreciate great products so it could be the table it could be the chair it could be the coffee making machine uh, it could be anything but i've always been on the digital end of things when it comes to designing and implementation so software uh, touch screens mobile screens mobile apps so on and so forth um so yes so a bit about myself so um, I'm just going to list down some of the milestones that I have in terms of how I really grow in terms of my product knowledge that helps me. Uh, so the first is of course the digital movement. Um, for those who are not aware, basically TDM is one of the um, early groups that sort of bring in uh, unconference, that sort of uh, really gather the grassroots together uh, together with uh, E27, um, but E27 is the only one sort of that is kind of uh, last through the years. TDM is sort of inactive right now, um, but uh, we are the one who brought in Nexus and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, and I take pride in that, and and it's a it's a great bunch, and I think through TDM, I really really learn um, all that kind of it really opened my eyes to what. Uh, software is uh, to what digital means to the people uh, and then I move on to creative technology so I was with uh, I was under uh, Mr. Simon Wu. Um, so I was under the PDE personal digital entertainment um, creating products mainly digital softwares uh, that runs the mp3 the softwares and so on and so forth so it is through creative that I was exposed to UI at that point of time, no one is really talking about UX yet. Uh, it's all just about, a lot about usability, a lot about uh, human interaction, but none about user experience as a whole. Uh, so that's, so in creative, it really opened my eyes to all these things. Then I moved on to venturing out into the unknown, meaning I came out for a good three years doing all sorts of things, uh, freelancing, and I learned a lot. Um, through, through it. Uh, it is also through this that I uh, was a uh, adjunct lecturer with both uh, Singapore Polytechnic and Republic Polytechnic. So I spent a good uh, three years as an adjunct lecturer uh, at the same time doing freelancing and so on and so forth. So I went into SP and RP and teach is because I realized that uh, the best way to learn is to teach. So I did that. <laughs> Uh, then I move on to book. Book is a great, great place. Um, 
It's great because I guess uh, there's really no one that locks over you, own time, own target, uh, uh, and I mean quite to the extreme. So it was fun, it's, it's really, really fun. Uh, but at the same time, I guess uh, I'm lacking that kind of discipline. Uh, so it's all my fault. So I enjoyed my time there. I really had a good time uh, getting to know Hong Cheng, um, getting to know the whole bunch of people, John, uh, Mohan, who in their own rights are very established kind of entrepreneurs, just that they kept it really low key. So I learned a lot from there in terms of products as well. And in fact, uh, Boop has a few products. So we just scale products and they're all for fun, which is, which is really great. Because there wasn't any pressure to kind of perform and make sure that the app kind of works. So we have a free play most of the time. Uh, then I move on to Vicky. Uh, Vicky is where I know a few people here. Uh, and it was great. Um, Razmik, CEO, was a really great guy. Um, but I guess in one way or another, I decided to move on from that. Basically, I, I kind of helped uh, the team as well as along with the rest of the team to do a major redesign of the site across board for the web as well as for the mobile apps. So I, I, I left after the kind of the first, at least the first or the second phase of the redesign is complete. Um, I left Wiki is primarily really because I felt that I have lost the empathy. I mean, in my field of work, it's very important that I am able to empathize with the users. Um, and I, I really reflected upon what I'm doing at Viki. Um, Viki is a great company, but on my own, I have lost that empathy. Uh, for goodness sake, I don't really watch dramas. So it's really tough to be building things which you don't do yourself. So I plucked myself up, though it was very difficult, I think I'm already pretty in a good place and comfortable place there, but I chose to, I mean, sort of remove myself. Um, then I move on to Redmark, uh, which is the role that I'm in right now, uh, specifically taking care of uh, the roadmaps, features. So I started, I mean, my background is in um, engineering, uh, tech, so my first work, which I didn't include here because I don't really learn, is basically I was doing SIM card programming um, with Giseke and Devren, a German company. So that's where I started. Uh, but increasingly, my passion has always been in design and UX. So all along, I've been design and UX, but for Redmart, uh, it's, a, it's a slightly different role, mainly on product management. Uh, so I don't do design. You see all the very nice design, it's not I do one. Uh, basically, is this uh, is my is my colleague, great guy, great designer by the name of uh, Danny, Danny Liman Seta. So uh, he's a great designer. So I work alongside him very closely in terms of all UX, but in terms of execution, it's him. So I sort of work with the stakeholders and uh, the senior management to uh, prioritize our features, to do up our roadmaps, and to help the tech team and the design team and the business team to execute these plans. So that's where I am right now. So that's, that, that shows my kind of product knowledge uh, of where I started and where am I right now. But I guess in all of my uh, places that I learn, I think nothing beats having your own children. I think uh, you just learn so much more, at least to me. Uh, to be able to kind of really look through their eyes when they first saw the iPhone, I still remember uh, their eyes listed, uh, lit up um, and it was just so intuitive to them and that's why I kind of feel that Apple is kind of a pure product pure product meaning it's a great product um, and looking through their eyes really changes how I look at products uh, from tables to chairs even from touch screens and so on and so forth uh, so, okay, okay, sorry. So, uh, so, so over the years, I've kind of come up with this set of principles. I mean, it's still growing. I'm still learning, but I thought that it's 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 interesting to just share and then maybe hear from everyone. Basically, I think it's less than six or five. Um, so, yeah. So one thing that I learned in all these years about products is that, I mean, in terms of my role, I think it also involves some of your roles is, um, 
you know, I am not the mini CEO. Uh, I have, people always think that, you know, product managers have all the say uh, in terms of the features, but in actual fact, uh, you have none. Um, you have no real um, power in that sense, but all, all that you can do is basically sharpen your persuasion skills. And I believe that that is one of the main skills that you need to uh, sharpen. So product managers, team leads are servants. Uh, we are servants. Servants and exist to serve the tech, business and UX team. Um, some people can't really wrap their head around that, but that's the truth. Um, and, and, and I guess if you don't enjoy that, probably you're not PM, uh, you're not suited for PM. Um, so, yeah. Any take on this? Do y'all agree? Who is a, sorry, uh, just to get a sense, everyone is a, a tech developer engineer here. Any PMs here? So what do y'all think? I mean, unless, unless uh, you are the CEO, you know. You, do you, you mean like servants in what sense? Like you listen to every request? No, 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 not, not necessarily listen to every request. Uh, I mean, part of product management is saying no. Yeah. Uh, but uh, more or less, we are the coordinators, facilitators, yeah. rather than making the decisions uh, to say, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is the focus that we're going to do. Because in the end, of the, unless you are, you're a loner, because m most of the time it's coming from a senior management and you have to kind of digest it, uh, massage it, uh, lead them through it, and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, personally, I don't, I don't really uh, believe in a mini CEO uh, comparison, to be honest. But you know, I, I yeah, I agree with the coordinator, uh, you know, the communicator, capital. Uh, yeah, I, I raise this up as quite an important point because I mean, throughout the years, I've worked with developers, and um, there are certain companies which don't have PMs and where the developers is well, are very happy you know uh, and then there are companies where there are product managers which i felt that at certain points there are tensions um, because i felt that at certain points a pm will go and tell the designer hey you shift one pixel down and hey change this to yellow uh, because i'm a firm believer of you know if you are designers and they are hired to design let them design uh, and empower them to go forth. Um, so, and as well as the same for developers. Um, I can suggest, I can persuade, but in the end of the day, I guess in terms of whatever framework that the front enders or the back enders wants to use, it's wholly up to them. Uh, so I thought that that's an important point and I learned that. Uh, second, start with users and work outwards. I try to start with a blog post, internal and external FAQs. Uh, I'm not sure in your experience working does your PM do this. Uh, I'm trying to do this, which means that before any features is being created, uh, it needs to start. My next point is about uh, validating assumptions. Um, it needs to start with a blog post. Why? Uh, most of the time, these two things, blog posts and FAQs, right, is the last thing that the PM do. Uh, but I felt that it helps tremendously uh, if we start with that. Why? Because I think when you force yourself to write a blog post about that feature uh, or that particular module, you frame yourself in your customer's shoes. Uh, you're writing for them, you're building it for them. And I think it helps to frame it nicely. And, and as well as internal and external FAQs, I think it really, really helps. So that we just address all the internal questions that all the stakeholders have. Personally, as a PM, I have lots of questions as well. So I keep a document that I will just dump all the questions in and then set up a meeting to make sure that all is answered and everyone is very clear. And at the same time, it will also help to dump in and show in the external FAQs. Uh, what will customers ask? Um, and it helps to get everyone on board, including your customer service reps, um, so that they are very clear in terms of that feature that you're building and everyone is on the same page. So I thought this is, this is an important thing. I'm still trying to kind of really do it. Um, it's, all this is easier said than done. Huh? Um, but 
it's important. Knowledge is good. So. <laughs> It really depends if it is like a really small feature or feature that we want to write a press release with. I mean, we still have press release like in this time and age. It, it works in one way or another. So, so it depends on how big is the feature. If it's just a small feature enhancements, for example, like UI enhancements, like that, normally we don't. But we tie into, if you're going to write a press release, we'll do this. So it's, you, you can see it as a press release as well. Do you, do you have an example that we can discuss? I don't know. Uh, That's a really good point. Oh. oh. We just started our blog. Uh, we are very... We do that mostly on Facebook. Okay. I have some examples, but I didn't list it out here. So maybe I can share all the examples later. How about the internal... Uh, external feature? Like, how okay, sure. it's, it's for all the... You know, those that you don't release on the blogs. Do that for the sure, sure. I mean, internal and external FAQs is really important. I mean, to me, it really helps to get everyone on the same page. Uh, because in the end of the day, whether is the feature big or small, uh, we will attempt to put in the FAQs. Customer end. Uh, so, I mean, later I can show you guys some examples. So, do you go into your testing? Because, I mean, this is like some question, right? Uh, question of, of features. So there are some replies, question and answer. So do you use that as part of your test plan? Uh, not really. I don't see this as as uh, as as a testing plan. It can derive from here, but I think that is a much later process when we involve the tech team to evaluate. Basically, this is um, important so that we can go forth to the tech team and say that this is exactly how, sort of, we want to build. Uh, do we all have any input? And that is another round of FAQs as well. So it's a lot of to and fro. It's a growing document. Uh, it's sort of, rather than growing, it's a living document. So, yeah. So, so basically, this document is going to help when we do up our functional requirements and our technical requirements. So our functional requirements consist of bits and pieces of all this. Um, the internet, external FAQs, uh, questions about the API that we need to support, some of these will be answered as well. So, but it's just a quick way to just throw all the questions there from all the stakeholders. So that we can come again. Uh, you ever, you ever driven, like, Not really. Oh, okay, okay. So basically, you write uses, you write a feature first. Like user then, story, like basically yeah, yeah. testing in a way of using user stories and scenarios. As a as No, at this moment, no. Yeah. So, uh, validate your assumptions. Do not waste engineering cycles. Uh, examples. So I face this a lot, you know, like, and and I guess as PMs and as, um, as 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 people who trigger features, uh, really need to learn this. I'm learning this to really validate our assumptions and do not waste engineering cycles. I'm sure y'all have experienced that, y'all. You, know, uh, you know the 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 senior management said that hey, we got to build this. This is going to be the thing, and then it got shelves, and then no one used it. <coughs> Um, so, I mean, one of the one of the example is basically guest checkout. In e-commerce, uh, it's 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 expected that you should have guest checkout. Yes, no. Meaning that you you you'll get to check out without registering for an account. It's a norm, uh, you know, in typical e-commerce because you want to lower down the barrier. Uh, from people buying products from you. So that is uh, the most requested feature. So people ask, hey, how come Redmart don't have guest checkout? We should have guest checkout, you know. We should lower down the barrier. But I think if you were to look deeper and you were to really 
I mean, it's still an assumption, right? People that people need guest checkout. I really agree that people need guest checkout for typical e-commerce, like Apple, uh, that you sell just, you know, people might just come today and then might not come another day or might not come weekly. You would want to close the deal as soon as possible. And sometimes registering for an account is a barrier. And fine, there's a place for that. But not for Redmart, not for groceries. Uh, for groceries, in fact, it is an empty pattern for us to have a guest checkout. In fact, we don't want them to be guests. We want them to be a loyal customer. Uh, this is because if you were to tie into our business model, uh, we are very much, um, our margins are very much dependent on our deliveries cost. So just imagine if we were to really encourage guest behavior that they will just buy once and they'll never be seen again. What happens is that we'll lose money. We'll lose money in that delivery. Um, so we want them to come back. It is a behavior that we want to discourage. And if you look across all e-groceries uh, websites, uh, Amazon Fresh, uh, Food Relays, Ocado of uh, UK, um, Tesco online, those big online, you know, uh, they don't have guest checkout. So that's the reason why we don't have guest checkout. Yeah. But how do you validate? Just now you go through the reason, you go through your business plans, go through your business assumptions, this is not good guest checkout. Right. How do you actually come up with ways to validate it? Okay, if you have money, you buy reports. Uh, <laughs> you, if, uh, if you have no money then I think you really have to do your research so we spend a bit of money not a lot uh, from BEMA uh, very strong in e-commerce research uh, B-A-Y-M-A-R-D uh, they have a whole range of uh, reports it's one of the best uh, so we subscribe to it and they constantly have reports that validates these assumptions. Um, so if it is not in the report, uh, and for free, I always email the top research experts. Um, because not everyone has the privilege of having a full-fledged UX team in terms of UX scientists and that goes out and really validate your assumptions. So what I do is that I will email these guys, like for example, the founder of BEMA, uh, I'll email, A. Hey, what do you think of this? And have at least from an academia point of view and as a research point of view, there's some validation and that's what I do. Uh, and some of this validation it ties into business models and yeah, I mean it will surface if you were to look deeper. I mean one of the thing that, one of the assumption is also when you shop for groceries, you know, in a typical brick and mortar shopping mall, you, everything is organized by aisles, right? by categories, baby, food, uh, food cupboard, and so on and so forth. Is it necessary that we translate wholesale to online? That's what people do. But again, that's an assumption that that is the behavior that people will be shopping with. Maybe not. You know? Maybe everyone is doing it wrong. Maybe we shouldn't show all the categories. Maybe we should be more... Uh, driven by human behavior, meaning that when you land on the page, um, and with the internet, it's possible to go back to the olden days of when you step into a brick and mortar store, like a small shop, right? Last time, no supermarkets. When you step in a small shop, you, people will know you by name, you know? Hey, Howie, uh, you want to check out something fresh from us? Or, hey, Howie, we got some new products, you know? Here's the bunch, check it out. Um, yeah, I mean, that can happen more. Uh, one of the good examples is basically food relays. If you look at it, foodrelays.com. Uh, they don't go by category. So when you land on the page, you don't see any categories, but rather you will see a set of categories that says ways to shop. So you can shop by new, you can shop by top, 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 top. Then only on the second page and forward, you will see the categories, you will see the brands. So that's how uh, understanding your customer behavior is important. And that's part of validating your assumptions. Uh, the next thing is major on the major solve a hard problem that lots of people share. Uh, it helps me a lot in terms of 
feature prioritization, like you know, uh, what exactly to build. Um, so this is the one major on the major solve a hard problem that lots of people share, and it's not just about solving a hard problem, uh, but it's about solving the hard problem. The, the keyword here is a lot of people share. Um, so if a customer were to write in and complain, you know, verbal abuse you or whatever. Uh, I think you can safely ignore them if it is just him and he's very opinionated. Um, I learned, I mean it's very different. Like, I learned a lot through Vicky as well. Uh, Vicky is, you know, because they serve millions of people. So once you push a feature out, it's like hundreds of hate mails will come through and you have to cope with it. And uh, I think I built my emotions stronger after that. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, Solve a hard problem that lots of people share. Any, any, any take on this? Uh, sorry, what do you mean by a lot of people share? A, lo a lot of people share means that it's it's a pain point to a lot of people, and not just a guy or you know a customer. It might not be valid, and that's also a way of validating her assumption. If it is really true, then a large percentage of her customers will feel the same. Do you have an example of what a major versus a minor thing? A major is basically, I mean, a minor, a minor thing is that hey, I don't like read that your website is too. Ah, yeah, yeah. An example is this. Re recently, uh, we, recently we have, uh, it's Christmas, right? So we <coughs> run some promos. So we have snows. We have snows. Uh, and and uh, people write in to say I hate the snow. You know, remove the snow is very irritating. You know, but we already minimize. You know, it's like really very subtle. Already, I mean, I mean, some of you must have seen lah. You know, it's already very subtle. But I think people will still complain lah. You know, so so that is a minor. So you can look at that and then you say, and then if you are not like strong, right? You, 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 you can say, oh yeah, or maybe it's really irritating. Eh? Okay, okay, okay. Trigger the tech team, the front end guys to hey, shut it down. It's pissing people off. But it's just maybe one guy, lah, uh, or maybe one customer, and maybe they are Scrooge. So from that, <laughs> from that I learned that in this world, there's two kinds of people. One that look at the snow and be filled with joy and one that look at the snow and be pissed off. <laughs> so you can decide which one you are. <laughs> I think one of the, in terms of the feedback mechanism loop is important. Um, yes, not not exactly focus group. I mean, we don't invite people to come in. Uh, we do sketch and send across to some people to validate our assumptions internally. Um, but but I mean, in terms of where we are, um, a lot of them are pretty basics. But in terms of that feedback mechanism loop, I think having a channel that is always available uh, is important. Um, that's why, I mean, we have FAQs, we have an easy way, I mean, uh, we have an easy way where you can give feedback. And I think it's, it's, it's more than them giving feedback, I think replying to their feedback. A good customer service team is essential in this mechanism loop. I mean, because most of the time, you won't be really interfacing with the customers or talk to the customers. It's going to be your customer service team, at least on my side, it is. And so in terms of their professionalism and all that, they just need to be very much on the ball. Uh, and the good thing is also when the guys goes out for deliveries, uh, we do ask for feedback as well. And at least every quarter, we do send out a uh, survey. Uh, to get customer satisfaction feedback and so on and so forth. So, uh, basically, the best cost 
Yes, yes. Yes, yes. I mean, I mean, it's. I mean, basically, it's the previous points about like start with the user and work outwards. I mean, if you are, if you are, if you are, kind of solving hard problems that a lot of people share, most of the time, the pain points is not like, hey, why do you do this? It's more of, I think you can do this better, and that's good feedback. Uh, and it's very different from, uh, pissing the user off. With and with a with a feature that they will not use and in fact hinder them from doing whatever they want to do, versus feedback that said that hey this is good maybe you can improve on it. So I mean that that kind of loop yeah, we do have it constantly. I think I think I think it helps that those that kind of built it that those that kind of plan the features for it are are. Are using the service as well. I think that helps. I mean, my whole family, at least I made them uh, buy groceries through Redmart. Except for those things that we have yet to be added, which is soon, which is uh, fresh and frozen. Um, but anything else is all through Redmart. And they give me feedback. I make my uh, parents in law do that as well. Uh, and everyone I know do that as well. It helps. Because you are using it uh, yourself. Yes, and which is why earlier I was talking about Vicky, right? I don't watch drama. I lost the empathy. <laughs> I cannot empathize. Uh, next point: seek first to understand, then to be understood. This from Stephen Covey. Uh, don't jump in with a concluded mindset. I mean, this is this is what I learned. Uh, a lot of times, uh, as PMs, you already have a concluded mindset. And, uh, so when the designer give feedback or the developers give feedback, um, there's a lot of communication breakdown. And likewise, I think the same goes for the rest, the developers and the designers. Um, so I think less opinionated is good in in teams. That's what I believe. <coughs> Uh, build the simplest thing that can possibly work. So for us at Redmart, part of it means going mobile first. Uh, so this is an approach uh, that we have taken. It's it it, it 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 can be very expensive, expensive in a way that uh, coordination needs to be very seamless. Um, because when we launched, we would want to launch on uh, both the mobile apps the mobile apps as well, as well as the web app. So in order for that to happen in a very coordinated uh, fashion, we need to be very seamless. Everyone needs to be on the same page all the time. And everyone's pace sort of needs to be, we need to catch up with one another. For example, Android, um, <coughs> because there's no review or approving process, it's fairly easy to update but not so for the iPhone. So for iPhone, you don't know, it's a mystery, you know, it can take five days, it can take one week, and sometimes they come back finding fault with you. Um, and then the web is fairly easy, you can just, because it's own holy body. So, I mean, one of the thing is, I mean, that's, that's for launching. Um, but in terms of building things, uh, we start mobile first, so that we make sure that any features that we build, is built for mobile and then we branch out from there. Uh, so it has worked so far for us, uh, but it's kind of expensive. Uh, communication needs to be in tip top condition. So unless it's uh, this is this is mainly for big features. For smaller tweaks and all that that's fine. Uh, 
uh, continuous improvements, that's fine. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, this is one thing that I learned as well. You ship what you have, not what you want. Uh, product management is basically saying no. Uh, I think a lot of times what is really delaying teams from shipping is really, you know, they, 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 they look forward to the perfect software, uh, but a lot of times, uh, no, you don't get the perfect software. Uh, you ship what you have, and then we deal with the problems. Uh, because until, unless you ship, like what I said earlier, uh, uh, I'm not performing if you don't ship. Well, of course, you don't ship crappy stuff out. Like, I mean, it needs to go through proper testing and all. Uh, but I think scope creep and feature creep is always an issue. So, need to say. Reverse, instead of scope creep, it's scope reduction. Uh, Where this is the agreed MVP, but along the way, you find that certain things get taken out. Right, right. So, I, I think it's, it's again, it's a lot of. I think it's a lack of like understanding and communication and not on the same page uh, before building. Uh, and I hear a lot of this from marketers. Are you are you from uh, um, yes. oh. Yeah, so so you hear a lot of this from marketers. Hey, I thought we are building this but it's not you know, or UX or designers lah. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's supposed to be like that, you know, like you know the transition are uh, supposed to be like that. How come it's how come it's jerky? Uh? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I have that kind of frustrations uh, as well. But I think, but I think yeah, later points I'll cover that. But but I think it's really about being on the same page rather than really focusing on the end product. And I think it's also about the culture. Uh, a lot to do about the culture of excellence culture of product excellence and that kind of detail that you are going after um, and I think in anything it takes time to build that trust uh, and respect needs to be earned and if they don't respect you they won't build it they don't see eye to eye with you and I think that's what happened most of the time I mean that's my opinion um, so if you cannot measure it, one thing I learned is uh, you cannot improve it. Uh, this is by Lord Kelvin. So define actionable metrics, not vanity metrics. Again, easier said than done. Um, when you want to show something, you know, you just, oh, uh, how many people download this app? No. But that's about it. A lot of vanity metrics. Uh, but uh, I think what I learned is really to focus on the actionable metrics. For example, like uh, we have this uh, first time pop-up you know, so a vanity metric is basically just like oh, how many people see. That's it, lah. You know, I can focus on or oh, uh, eighty percent of people see. It. I mean, obviously, right? Or I can even go to a step further: how many people click on it. Uh, but an actual metric would be uh, to really go further down. Like for example, how many people see it, and how many people click on it, and how many people click on it that ended up buying. And not just buying. How many? How many days after they click on it that they ended up buying? Um, I think that needs to be defined. Though you might not build it, you know. Though your resources might be low in terms of having all these uh, tracking uh, codes in, but I think it's still good to list them down so that you have a framework to work with. So, any questions on this? Again, easier said than done. Ah. Do you mind sharing what you use to track the funnel? Uh, we are having a slight problem with that, actually. Uh, we use a lot of Google Analytics. We use, uh, actually, that's what we use. Because we have uh, a lot of other problems with other tools. Because basically, we are a uh, single <coughs> app. Uh, I mean, our back end is built on backbone. Um, so, a lot of things. Uh, so, so, basically, the, the script that is supposed to track all these things, right? Just view it at just one view. Uh, because it's the same app. So, even though we browse to 
different pages, it's hard for us to track unless we really, I mean, it takes extra effort. Um, I mean, that's what, I mean, it's expensive, la. but again, in the end of the day, I guess you just need to weigh on the UX and the front end as well. You want to oh, so sweet, sweet, man. So, then, so, so the decision of I believe uh, speed is one of the main reasons. Um, the performance is very good. You, you, you guys actually have a pretty heavy page, but you don't see the, you don't really feel the heaviness because all your action is actually uh, no, no. your base friends doesn't get reload. You just load whatever you needed for that particular uh, particular uh, category and then fetch the images yeah. one by one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's really nice. I mean I mean kudos to the front end team. I mean I mean they decide which framework to go. But again I felt that it's important to have a team that you can see eye to eye. That they understand UX as well that they want to do that. They believe that speed is a feature, not a requirement. Um, yeah, so, I mean, kudos to them. I think, I mean, we, we do believe that we are one of the fastest e-commerce sites do around, track, if not the world. Do you track that metrics? Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, in terms of speed loads and all that, yeah, I think, I think we, we, we perform above average, definitely. But again, it brings in other pain points which needs to be considered. For example, we don't uh, support uh, old browsers, we support modern browsers. So if you were to look from a business standpoint, you know, the business guys will say, hey, why is it IE6 not supported? Eh? We, are, we are losing a percentage of our sales. On it. It's true, it's true. Uh, but at the same time, I think UX needs to be considered. And, and, and I think we try our best to look forward to the future. I mean, there's a reason why Steve Jobs not include Flash. Um, because he's looking forward to HTML5, so on and so forth. So we, we, we try, but I think there's a lot of tension as well, which needs to be balanced. Who makes the call at the end of the day? I think the uh, I think engineering. Or? Yeah, yeah. The engineering makes the call. The tech team. I mean, again, kudos to them. Uh, the front end team. I think they reasoned well. Um, uh, when they implemented backbone, I, I wasn't there yet. So it's a good decision. Overall. So uh, always be shipping. That's how I measure my performance against uh, what's yours. How do you measure your performance against? Uh, I think as a tech team, as a UX, and as a business, uh, if we take too long to ship, you know, I, I think um, there's there's a problem in that. So 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 I think we try to always uh, prevent scope from happening. We always prevent that you know last minute additions to the features. Uh, it's a no no unless it's like really very critical and doable. If it's going to hold back the launch date in a significant amount of time, then we will say no. Um, so, how long is your average cycle? Uh, it's still in a blur right now, but we have. I mean. We have continuous integration, so I mean we don't push daily, uh, but we do push weekly at least. So and uh, we learned that we shouldn't push on a Friday. Uh, I mean all these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. <coughs> I didn't want to go party. Really. So uh, yeah. Last point. Second last point. Uh. I learned to be humble, uh, always. Uh, less ego goes a very long way. Um, I think over the years I learned that how you handle uh, your work 
in terms of teams, uh, it's very much how you handle your family as well, uh, or your human relationships with people. So, so I just felt that you know it's good to be humble. You know, even though that you are like very very smart, it's good to be humble. Um, and yeah, I I think you don't always need to be right. Uh. Okay lah, I'm wrong. Very good. Uh, and then move on. Again, I think it's all about majoring the major. Uh. So one last point. So in my role, uh, this statement is very true. All that has been said, you know. The truth is product management morphs into whatever is needed by the organization. If the powers that be wants you to manage the ERP configurations or use worldwide to close orders or to buy the developer's coffee, you will do it. Uh, all the we need to be strategic motos go, go out of the door when you are tossed into the tactical morass. Um, a lot of my roles is really um, is in attention is 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 saying no uh, so it's i mean no one likes to say no right i mean yeah you want to build something and then i every day say no i i every day question you will also be pissed with me so and sometimes even though you say no you still have to do it you know yeah hey i thought we are strategic you know this one not yet you know later and no 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 you must do it uh over the years, I think it happens a lot, and I think such is the nature of the role. Uh, and my response to this is basically this: lah, suck it up, lah. Uh, be patient. That's what I learned. Um, so I leave you with a verse, which works for me. For everything, there's a season and a time for everything. Matter under heaven. So uh, I always remind myself of that. So it's fine. I don't get my way, it's, it's, it's fine. Uh, I will win the war. You can win the battle. <laughs> so, yeah, that's up. Uh, <coughs> any questions? Yeah. Um, how many percentage of the time you think is spent in doing this work? Like, for example, the request that comes in and you feel that it's fighting, you just do it? Um, that is... Uh, the lean thing right being lean lean UX you know um, where I mean where Redmart is I'm going to share my experience with Redmart because I see that it's a very uh, unique position we are we used to be a startup but I must say we are not anymore uh, because of the speed that we are growing uh, it's really like lightning I thought that yesterday I joined a startup Hey, but now you know we are we are we are we are growing up and we need to grow up uh, and the tension is that the tension is whether a lot of time is spent you know typing emails updating everyone uh, getting everyone on the same page um, I see that that's my role and it is important and there is a need especially when the organization is really growing um, for example, for companies that plans to go IPO, right? Uh, they need to have all these processes in. If not, they cannot get listed. You know? So where does the lean concept come in? You know, like, hey, lean, uh, I mean, although I know that lean doesn't mean no documentation, uh, but lean tends to lean towards uh, shipping fast and then, you know, just get it going and done. And a lot of times, a lot of things is being fall behind uh, for example like proper documentation and so on and so forth or time to really think through a feature and so on and so forth uh, so yes and no there are times that we see a pain point and we skip all the cues and we do it there are times that we have to go through to have that discipline to do the uh, functional requirements simply because it involves a lot of stakeholders um, our business is not just like front end our business is not just a web app you know, our business is also about warehousing that has dependencies on warehousing that has dependencies on the ERP that has dependencies on the operations a lot of operations um, so it's, it's not as clear cut as it is 
from where that I'm coming from in terms of startup, yeah, of course I love I love to just skip all that and don't firefight, you know, and just do what I feel is right. But I mean, that's why I have to heads off to GE General Electric, huge company, uh, lots of processes, um, but they have Eric Rice. Uh, they they have the money to hire Eric Rice to come in and think how can we be lean in such a humongous uh, company I think that's I mean we haven't reached that yet but we are moving towards that so there's a tension um, yeah so I don't have a lot of definite answer it's yes and no we try our best to cut the queue and just do what is being needed but at the same time there are times that there are features that we really need to have that discipline to follow through the proper process Project management tools do you guys use? Oh wow, we jump from one to another. Again, it's very real life, and you know? like you think that this is the tool, they have to come out with better tool. Uh, same for any other discipline, I guess. Uh, we are, I mean, at least myself, I'm using uh, this tool called PropPad, PropPad.com. It helps me to just. Uh, have all the backlogs there so that I can have a bird's eye view. Um, but to tell you the truth, right, I think I'm going to dumb it also. Um, <laughs> reason is this, and, and if you look into like what Google is doing, Amazon is doing, um, actually there's no such thing as a roadmap, <coughs> to tell you the truth. Um, you know, you can spend a lot of day, you can spend a lot of time on trying to think what are we going to build for the next one year? And then, well, you have very nicely, you know, like, okay, this quarter I'm going to build this, second quarter I'm going to build this. Um, but I think, to experience, I realized that uh, that doesn't really work. Um, and, and so what we trying to do is that every quarter, we will clear of all our roadmaps. And we will then ask ourselves the questions, what is the team that we're trying to focus right now? So we base ourselves more on teams rather than projects, uh, because it's 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 easier to then have focus on that team so that you have projects under it, rather than you have projects vying for each other against each other. It's harder to have that focus on that team. So, for example, the team for us now is to <coughs> uh, in <coughs> increase retention. For example then we make sure that all of our projects focuses on the team. So depending on the resources that you have, uh, you can have multiple teams running. But I think most of the time, one to three is more than sufficient. So to identify the overall team, everyone is on the same page, and then, and then I will pull out from the backlogs. Or for example, if there are new, better ideas, then we'll park it under the teams. Then we'll say for this quarter, we'll just focus on these teams. Any other projects or ideas outside of these teams, uh, we won't consider. Maybe the next quarter. So that's uh, where we are. I mean, again, um, we are always learning. Uh, yeah. So I'm sharing is not that you know uh, we are anywhere near. But I guess it's just good to share. Any other questions? One last questions. I'm curious what your process is in terms of picking up. Because let's say previously you became a previously developer. So they're all sort of dealing with different products. Um, so what's the process of picking up like let's say e-commerce, moving to Red Mart and learning about e-commerce, especially at the start where basically you're working with people who Obviously, since they were already there, they knew more than you. Um, how, how do you pick up uh, knowledge about this? I, I think there's a, there's a very good book that I can recommend. I mean, it's called Your First 90 Days. Um, I think that's really crucial. I mean, in any new company, your first 90 days is very crucial. Um, but I think it's really more of 
like uh, earning their trust more than anything. So how how do you do that? So I I drive so I take them to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because our office is very ulu. <laughs> so before before that, uh, no one really drives. Uh, so I, I I drive. So they look forward to lunch. <laughs> uh, I mean, not all of that, but at least th- there's an option, uh, and I drop them off to the nearest MRT to my home. Some of them, so they always know. Oh, how we can drop me off? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. I guess you do what you need to do. You know, including pow kopi, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think earning the trust is important. And earning that respect, because if you just go in and then you know you expect things to be done, I think. I mean, we are dealing with humans, so it's very different. Unless you are dealing with machines, uh, you just feed it something and then you will spit out. Something. <laughs> um, do you share your uh, backlog with your stakeholders? They come out with the backlog. Uh. They are they are the one who come out with the backlog. Um. My and role the, the again. Stuff that, you know, the, the, your timeline, your plan. Because you know, I, I just I'm kind of serious doing that because you know ultimately stakeholder just kind of focus on what they want, right? And so, like I, you know, there's been a lot of communication and whatnot, but um, it's been kind of hard for them to actually see what's going on, and they always ask for things that they want. Sure, sure, sure. Yes. Because I think a lot of stakeholders, they have this perception that if uh, there's no features that is coming out, yeah. means that the technique is not working. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a very common. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's very common. But I think there's a lot of like refactoring, improving processes, <coughs> changing frameworks, and so on and so forth, uh, which is unseen. And again, I guess that really boils down to, for example, the CTO's relationship with the CEO. Uh, getting the CEO on the same page that though you don't see any features coming out things are still moving uh, it is improving speed is improving uh, we shave off how many KB of CSS uh, so this needs to be taken into account uh, as well but again in terms of your question about roadmaps um, that's why there's a lot of articles that talks about uh, not showing your roadmaps to your stakeholders uh, because then they will just focus on that you know, and, and and I think in Redmart we are fortunate that I mean we understand that we are always learning. Um, so I mean we are trying out like not really having too long of a roadmap, but just to focus on that quarter and what needs to be done. I think that that helps rather than have a long, you know, share with everyone your entire backlog. And then every day they stare at it and then they realize, hey, how come it's not done? <laughs> how come it, it grows longer and longer? Uh, then it will frustrate them, you know. Because, you know, there, there's always a real tension between like, the business side of thing and the tech side of thing. <coughs> so they told me this company that this is there, but I always not think it's there. So why it's not here? It's not there. Yeah. So Maybe it's a resource issue, like, I don't know. It could be. Maybe everyone is maxed out, you know. No more bandwidth to do. Or it could be a communication problem. Or maybe the expectation is not there. Um, I mean, one thing that I really learned is also having weeklies with the business owners. Uh, uh, I when I first started, I I did not because if you if you to look at my background in terms of product, I'm I execute more then I manage and I communicate. Um, that's where I come from. And to me, it is a transition from being a maker designer <coughs> to now my main role is actually to communicate. And that's my main thing. It's very tempting to, I mean, with my design background, it's very tempting to you know give a lot of input to my designer. But I think, again, there's a and season for everything so I can give my input but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that okay 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.